Boa tarde a todos e a todas. Bem-vindos ao final do nosso, da nossa competição 3 Minutos Tese na Universidade de Coimbra. É com muito orgulho que vos tenho aqui, os nossos 20 finalistas, o nosso fantástico júri que tirou também do seu tempo para estar aqui e para motivar ainda mais os nossos candidatos a serem melhores apresentadores e a partilharem com todos a sua ciência. E para começarmos, gostaria de convidar então a Vice-Reitora para a Investigação e Terceiro Ciclo da Universidade de Coimbra, a professora doutora Cláudia Cavadas. Boa tarde a todos e a todas. Antes de mais, desejar a boa sorte a todos que vêm aqui exibir a ciência e a investigação que se faz na Universidade de Coimbra. Uh, Permitam-me que comece por agradecer, se calhar isto é tudo ao contrário, à, à Comissão Organizadora. Uh, que está liderada pela Ana Carvalho, tem feito um trabalho excepcional, uh, e dizer que este, esta competição internacional veio, e como sabem, todos penso que sabem, mas uh, é um desafio do Coimbra Group, o Coimbra Group que é uma, uma rede de 42 universidades europeias e neste momento em, em todas as universidades está a ocorrer esta competição para ter o melhor ou a melhor uh, tese de doutoramento em três minutos. Uh, é, pronto, é com muito gosto, isto é muito importante, esta, esta competição, porque permite os estudantes contactarem uns com os outros, das várias áreas, e permite também o desenvolvimento destas competências de comunicação, que são muito úteis, e é uma forma também de divulgar a investigação que está a ser realizada na Universidade de Coimbra. Mas, tão importante, ou se mais importante que os, que os nossos candidatos e as candidatas é o júri que realmente num momento de muito trabalho, que é sempre uh, despender o tempo a analisar as candidaturas e agora estão aqui para analisar as vossas, os vossos três minutos uh, sem mais demoras porque nós não, não me querem ouvir a mim, mas sim a ciência que está a ser feita, desejo a todos e todas muito boa sorte e contamos convosco para nos representar bem no, no Coimbra Grupo Para perceberem melhor o que é que é isto de conseguir condensar 80 mil palavras em apenas 3 minutos, sim, é este o desafio que lançamos aos nossos candidatos. Algo que provavelmente demoraria cerca de 9 horas a apresentar, terá que ser condensado em apenas 3 minutos. Para quem não está aqui, certamente não tem noção de qual é o trabalho que, tem, que está por detrás e o pensamento que tem que dedicar para conseguirem fazer este trabalho e condensar então as suas teses em três minutos. Como é que tudo vai funcionar? O desafio aqui é então em frente, aqui, a voz, mas depois de terem trabalhado numa primeira fase em que enviaram uh, os seus vídeos de três minutos e esses, esses vídeos uh, foram avaliados então pelo nosso júri, foram escolhidos os 20 melhores que estão aqui hoje para apresentar. Este desafio implica então serem capazes de condensar a sua tese numa forma simples e clara para todos, porque temos um júri que é das mais variadas áreas e por isso o desafio é esse, serem capazes então de transmitir isto de uma forma simples para que todos consigam aprender e conhecer melhor a ciência que é feita. O 3 Minutos Tese está hoje na terceira edição, o 3 Minutos veio pela primeira vez para a Universidade de Coimbra em 2019-2020, em que tivemos a primeira edição presencial e afinal aconteceu na Casa das Caldeiras, em que temos aqui o nosso grupo de finalistas. Neste caso o vencedor foi o Mauro Pinto, que nos, que nos apresentou a sua tese de uma forma brilhante e que deu mote para uma segunda edição no ano 2021, mas aqui nesta versão online, que foi também um desafio e que veio mudar um bocadinho também a dinâmica do 3 minutos, tivemos que adaptar um bocadinho a dinâmica, mas cá estão todos os nossos finalistas que de casa foram capazes também eles de apresentar as suas teses. No ano passado tivemos como vencedora a Brigida Calado, que também ela foi a representante da Universidade de Coimbra na competição do Coimbra Group. Este ano. Tivemos 38 candidatos, dos quais temos aqui hoje os 20 finalistas e o objetivo é então escolher o nosso representante para que possa entrar na próxima fase da competição e daí serem escolhidos os três melhores, os três melhores das 42 universidades do, grupo, do Coimbra Grupo, que depois irão então à Assembleia Geral do Coimbra Grupo entre 7 a 10 de junho na Universidade de Pádua, com, chegar aqui à conclusão de qual a melhor tese de doutoramento em 3 minutos de todo este grupo, basicamente de toda a Europa. 
É esta a competição e eu digo-vos, hoje temos aqui os nossos 20 finalistas, mas eu adoraria que daqui saísse hoje o vencedor para que podermos depois irmos juntos até Pádua para representar a Universidade de Coimbra e estarmos pela primeira vez na grande competição e na grande final desta competição. Vamos a isto? Espero que sim. Assim sendo... E depois de, de vos dar um bocadinho a conhecer, e também já temos falado aqui do júri que temos connosco e que de facto tem dedicado o seu tempo também a, a, a avaliar-vos e para que desta forma consigamos chegar ao melhor de todos, para chegarmos aqui houve um caminho e eles avaliaram não só a compreensão, a forma como vocês fizeram a, a vossa explanação, o conteúdo científico, mas também de que forma é que foram capazes de transmitir a vossa mensagem de uma forma a, apelativa e de forma a que todos sejam capazes de compreender. São estes os critérios de avaliação que os júris têm em conta nesta competição. Para chegarem aqui, os finalistas tiveram a oportunidade de passar por dois dias muito ativos de, 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 de treino em comunicação de ciência e em media training, que aconteceram no dia 23 e 24 de fevereiro no, no nosso, na nossa casa Costa Alemão, a sede do Instituto de Investigação Interdisciplinar, onde todos juntos, acredito eu, cresceram, conheceram mais sobre comunicação de ciência e aqui numa equipa de formadores que me incluiu a mim, ao Jorge Figueira, que faz parte do projeto especial de R&D International, que está assediado que está também, apesar de ser da reitoria, localizado no Instituto de Investigação Interdisciplinar e juntamente com a Marta e com a Karine e também com a equipa da Speak and Lead, acredito eu, cresceram, promoveram ainda melhor o seu conhecimento sobre comunicação de ciência, melhoraram as suas apresentações e estão aqui hoje prontíssimos para vos apresentar o melhor da sua, das suas apresentações. Nestes dias aprenderam sobre comunicação de ciência, Perceberam também de que forma é que podem melhorar os seus próprios projetos, incluindo tarefas de comunicação de ciência, para mostrarem mais da sua ciência até à comunidade e, mais do que isso, foram também capazes de, em conjunto, melhorarem as suas técnicas de comunicação, como estar em palco, como comunicar e depois com, uma, com a capacidade de melhorar e de aprender ao longo do tempo, terem também a capacidade e a possibilidade de se conhecerem uns aos outros e de estarem num ambiente de colegas de diferentes áreas, num, num pleno uh, com, uh, ambiente de uh, networking, para assim também crescerem junto uh, de outras uh, áreas e de outros colegas. Depois destes dois dias, estão aqui, agora hoje, preparadíssimos então para avançar com estas uh, teses em três minutos. Para chegarmos aqui, temos então os nossos 20 finalistas, fizemos um sorteio para garantir que não havia aqui influência nenhuma eh, em todo o processo e temos aqui então a lista eh, de que forma é que os nossos 20 candidatos vão apresentar as suas teses. Vamos então, entretanto, começar. Antes de começar, só relembrar as regras. Têm então até 3 minutos para apresentarem a sua tese. Vão fazê-lo em inglês, porque trata-se de uma competição internacional e para enviarmos depois o vídeo do finalista para a Coimbra Group terá que ser em inglês. Podem ter atrás de si um slide, um único slide, e devem fazê-lo, tal como já devem ter percebido. A gravação está a ser feita em contínuo, não pode haver qualquer tipo de cortes e o vídeo tem que ser enviado com um só documento e sem qualquer tipo de cortes depois para o Coimbra Group. Não podem usar qualquer tipo de atrezos, não podem cantar ou recitar. Faz parte das regras também. Desculpem se estavam à espera de outro tipo de espetáculo, mas aqui hoje estamos a falar de ciência. Assim sendo, e de seguida vamos ter então os nossos 20 finalistas, cada um tem 30 minutos, desculpem, 3 minutos, queriam 30 minutos, só 3 minutos, 3 minutos para apresentar as vossas teses e depois dos 20 iremos dar então cerca de 20 minutinhos só para garantir que a avaliação do júri está coesa, está tudo pronto e nesses 20 minutos vocês vão ter a oportunidade de ir lá fora um bocadinho descansar e comer qualquer coisa com o nosso coffee break que temos ali, enquanto nós decidimos aqui quem é então o vencedor e que irá representar a Universidade de Coimbra na competição internacional do Coimbra Group. Assim sendo e depois desta apresentação uh, se calhar não tão breve, mas que peço, espero que tenham percebido melhor como funciona a competição. Vamos então começar. Já vos disse, são 20 e têm apenas 3 minutos. Assim sendo, vamos começar com o primeiro, que é o Finifolo Cambalém. 
O Fini Fol vem-nos apresentar a sua tese intitulada Experimental Studies of Superconductivity in Iron Based Layered Compounds. Ele vem da, do doutoramento em Física da Matéria Condensada da Faculdade de Ciências e Tecnologia da Universidade de Coimbra. This was the exclamation of one of the characters of uh, Avatar movie when he saw the floating mountains of uh, Hallelujah in Pandora. Well, the possible explanation of this scene is the phenomenon I'm studying in my PhD, superconductivity. Superconductivity is similar to the normal electricity that we have here, but it is more sophisticated because the electrons, instead of moving independently, they move in pairs. So moving in this way, they can avoid the scattering and losses. In other words, if we short circuit a wire of superconducting material, the stream of electrons in this wire will flow for 100 years without getting weaker. Additionally, a superconducting material in the presence of an external magnetic field, it will expel. It means that it can float or levitate. Differently from Pandora, in our real planet, to achieve superconductivity, we must cool down materials to very low temperatures, about minus 200 degrees Celsius. And not all materials become superconducting and we don't know yet why it is so. So, to fill up this gap, I'm studying iron-based compounds that are not superconducting and compare them with the superconducting materials that are similar in atomic structure and the chemical properties. Using experiments and uh, uh, computer calculations, hoping um, to find what makes the superconducting material so special so that in this way I can uh, influence the material scientists and engineers to synthesize compounds in the future that can become superconducting at ambient uh, pressure and temperature. If we get um, superconductivity in ambient temperature and, um, and pressure, we can, extend, uh, we can extend the application of these materials to our daily life. This means that uh, we can go out of a medical application to uh, application of uh, superconducting materials into uh, electrical energy generation and transmission. Actually, I think that only our imagination and creativity will be the limit. I want everyone here in the future to look around and say, oh my God. Obrigada, Finifolo. Seguindo, então, para a Vera Almeida. A Vera Almeida traz-nos a tese de Spirituality in University Academic Culture around the Sustainable Education and Planetary Citizenship. A Vera vem de, do doutoramento em Ciências da Educação da Faculdade de Psicologia e Ciências da Educação da Universidade de Coimbra. Hi everyone, let me ask you a question. Do you want to change the world for the better? Just a moment. First, listen to me, please. My friends, in my time as professor, I felt that the universities nowadays invest much in a professional and a technical training for their students. However, a professional is not only formed by his or her technical knowledge, but also by its mental, emotional, and spiritual balance. In my thesis, I am investigation if it is possible 
to add spiritual and humane values to university education beyond the technicals. I am already interview professors from University of Coimbra, uh, from different areas, and create biographical narratives about their practices and knowledge related to spirituality, sustainable education, and planetary citizenship. In the future, I will promote a symposium between university professors from Portugal and from the world, create a place to share experience and opinions, collecting suggestions proposing in this meeting aiming to, in the future, uh, upgrade and utilize them in new teaching methods and new symposiums. Look at me and reflect. Will it be accepted in university academic culture reflections about spirituality, sustainable education, planetary citizenship, provide a moralistic and humane education? We shall see. Now, I ask again, do you want to change the world for the better? I see in the professors a sea of infinite possibilities to achieve this goal. Thank you. Obrigada, Vera. Seguimos então para a próxima apresentação, que vai ser do Kevin Leandro. O Kevin traz-nos a tese Extracellular Vesicles as a Platform to Deliver CRISPR-Cas9 System to Treat Machado Joseph Disease. Vem do doutoramento de Ciências Farmacêuticas da Faculdade de Farmácia da Universidade de Coimbra. Imagine that on your 30s you start having difficulties controlling the movement of your arms and legs, and even swallowing and speaking become increasingly difficult. Imagine that you knew this would happen for a very long time since this disease was genetically inherited from your parents, as you also know that eventually you're going to become dependent on a wheelchair and die prematurely. Can you imagine yourselves in this position? This is the reality of patients suffering from Machado Joseph disease, a highly debilitating disorder that is caused by a DNA mutation which leads to the death of, of neurons in the brain. This one genetic mutation is the only requirement to develop this devastating disorder. And to make the case even worse, there are no treatments available. Not even one. Developing a therapeutic strategy for Machado Joseph disease faces three major challenges. The first one is developing the therapeutics itself. The second one is delivering these therapeutics to the brain. And the third one is assuring human safety. Today, I came here to present my PhD project in which we aim to overcome these challenges and find a potential therapy for Machado Joseph disease. To tackle the first challenge, we are going to use a revolutionary technology that awarded the Nobel Prize of Chemistry in 2020. This technology is called CRISPR-Cas9 and it allows us to correct or eliminate genetic mutations in a very specific manner. CRISPR-Cas9 works like a DNA scissor, allowing us to eliminate mutated genes and prevent diseases from their source. The second challenge is delivering CRISPR-Cas9 to the brain. The brain is one of the most difficult organs to reach because it is incredibly protected. To solve this, we are going to deliver CRISPR-Cas9 inside very small carriers called exosomes. Exosomes are revolutionizing medicine. They are produced by our own cells and they are capable of protecting and delivering CRISPR-Cas9 working like a ticket to the brain. Our goal is to deliver CRISPR-Cas9 inside exosomes through the nasal cavity in order to reach the brain. The third and last challenge is human safety. To solve this, we are going to pioneer a novel strategy where CRISPR-Cas9 is only active in the brain for a very short period of time, preventing toxic events in other organs. Together, these three solutions bring to life a potential novel therapy for Machado Joseph disease. 
we combine the vision, knowledge and know-how to bring to life this potential revolutionary technology. Together, let's put an end to Machado Joseph disease. Thank you. Obrigada, Kevin. Seguimos então para o Jonathan Manzoli. Traz-nos então a tese Adaptative Energy Man Management Strategies for Electric Bus Fleets, a Hybrid Approach with Artificial Intelligence and Optimization Methods. Vem do doutoramento em Sistemas de Energia Sustentável da Faculdade de Ciências e Tecnologia da Universidade de Coimbra. How do you expect that transportation will be in 10 years from now? As a PhD candidate in energy sustainable systems and aware of the importance of decarbonizing our transportation sector, I've decided to start studying electric buses to better understand this panorama. In fact, today is not a matter if the vehicles will be electric in the future, but when they will be the majority in our streets. In 2030, more than half of the buses just here in Europe will be completely electric. But do you know that, unfortunately, we are not prepared to face this revolution 100%? I give an example. Imagine that we have a small fleet of electric buses, like comprising 20 vehicles, more or less. Do you know that this fleet needs the same energy and power requirements as a small European village? This is a lot of energy. And do you know, in other words, that the way that our electrical system is built today is not strong enough to support a transition to 100% electric mobility. So, how can we keep going forward, making our buses better, more sustainable, and of course electric, without compromising the entire electrical system? This is a big challenge, but I am addressing this challenge in my research. And I'm founding my research in three main aspects. First, I'm using artificial intelligence to better control the charging operation of the buses, making them smarter. I'm also using mathematical optimization to control the operation of the buses, avoiding any kind of energy waste in this process. And I am also studying the integration between the electrical grid with the buses to avoid any kind of problem in the grid. At the end of the day, the idea of my research is to combine all those three approaches into one single software solution that will help uh, the operation of these buses in a general way. If we want to reach the mobility of the future, and we need to be there very soon, it's mandatory to control and to manage the energy of our vehicles. In this sense, this research and my tool that I'm developing will help public transportation operators to design and to operate the buses networks of the future. In 10 years from now, I'm pretty sure that transportation will be completely different than it is today. But I'm also sure that the research that I'm developing will help our transportation and our vehicles towards a better, more sustainable and resilient future. Thank you very much. Obrigada, Jonathan. Seguimos então para a nossa quinta apresentação, que será feita por Helena Soresi, que nos traz o título Cartography to a Told City, Luanda's Narratives and the Creation of Literary Polyphony, vem do doutoramento em Materialidades da Literatura da Faculdade de Letras da Universidade de Coimbra. My story. If it is pretty or if it is ugly, it's up to you. I just swear I did not lie and that these facts happen in this land, our land, Luanda. This quote is the conclusion of Luandino Vieira masterpiece called Luanda. This collection of stories is not only an outstanding example of the Angolan literature, but it is also the starting point of my PhD project. We want to study the contemporary Angolan literature 
published after the end of the Civil War, trying to understand how Luanda's literary voices are embedded among themselves and deeply connected to the urban space of the city itself. With an interdisciplinary approach that involves postcolonial studies, urban cultural studies, and the materialities of literature, we're going to, first of all, analyze three contemporary novels published in the last 20 years about Luanda, study some documentaries about Kuduro and Luanda, and interview all the authors of the analyzed objects, both writers and directors. We're going to use a combined methodology. So we're going to use the traditional tools for the literary and documentary critical analysis and a multimodal discourse analysis. This way, we're going not only to investigate some theoretical concepts like orality, writing and polyphony, but we're going also to study how the Luanda's literary voices are created and represented, and how these voices are connected to the urban space itself. This way, we will develop a cartography of literary voices. Well, this is my project, this is my presentation. If it is pretty or if it is ugly, it's up to you now. Thank you, Helena. Now, we... in Portuguese. <laughs> então, agora passamos já ao Vitor Trece, que nos traz a tese de Neglect Diseases and the Right to Health. What is the negligence to be eradicated? O Vitor vem do doutoramento em Governação, Conhecimento e Inovação da Faculdade de Economia da Universidade de Coimbra. Despite the recognition of health as a human right, do you know in 21st century we have diseases of the poor and diseases of the rich? Diseases as leishmaniasis, dengue and chagas are named as neglected because they mainly affect the poor around the world. For this reason, there aren't new treatments, policies and marked incentives to develop new drugs for these diseases. Important to say, that's not only a problem located in the south of the world, as dengue in Peninsula Iber Iberian Peninsula shows. There is a consensus to frame this problem as a market failure. However, despite this consensus, the theories about how can we fix this failure are very divergent. I can put these theories in two big groups. The first one, for whom we are facing a problem of market efficiency, and the second one, who frames the problem as how can we protect social rights in a market economy? Through these theories, I can put my research question, that is, institutional arrangements based in the search of the profit are the solutions for neglect disease? My hypothesis is that they aren't, and to verify it, I intend to study two public-private partnerships that were built to deliver new health products for Chagas and for Dengue. I want, I want to see here not only the possibilities, but the limitations of these institutional arrangements in fight these problems. To conclude, I want with my research not only to contribute to Agenda 2030 of Sustainable Development Goals, but mainly to end the injustice we face nowadays. That is, if a child is poor or rich, should not and cannot be determinant if she will live or if she will die. Thank you.
Obrigada, Vítor. Depois do Vítor temos o Tiago. O Tiago Pires traz-nos a tese Novel Avian IGY Antibody Formulation to Combat SARS-CoV-2. É uh, doutorando do uh, Programa Doutoral de Biologia Experimental e Biomedicina do Instituto de Investigação Interdisciplinar da Universidade de Coimbra. Good afternoon. How would you feel if I tell you that chicken eggs hold the cure for SARS-CoV-2? As you're aware, the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has caused a humanitarian and socioeconomic crisis across the world. This crisis led to the development of new strategies to develop new vaccines and antiviral drugs. My proposal involves the crea creation of avian antibodies that target a surface protein of the virus called the spike protein. This spike protein is responsible for the interaction between the virus and the target human cell. But why am I focusing on avian antibodies? Due to the evolutionary distance between avians and mammals, avian anti avians can create more robust and sensitive antibodies against mammalian proteins. Furthermore, we can extract the avian antibodies from the egg yolk, which is considerably easier compared to extracting antibodies from mammalian blood. This also means that this is a more scalable, low-cost mode of production of antibodies compared to mammalians. My project will start with a, with a uh, design of a series of vaccines with the spike protein. These vaccines will be used to humanize chickens and quails. And after immunization, I'm going to collect the eggs and the the genetic information of the antibodies to create an antibody library with differentiating uh, um, degrees abilities to, uh, to bind to the spike protein. This antibody library will be tested to see if it can, if it can, if it can neutralize the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I hope with this work to elucidate the mode of action of avian antibodies and to create new biodrugs to fight SARS-CoV-2. I believe that chicken, quails and other avians will in the future protect, help us protect ourselves against present and future pandemics. I thank you for, for your attention. Obrigada, Tiago. Seguimos agora para a oitava apresentação da Filipa Gouveia, que traz a tese Targeting the Brain Green and Jotensin System by Nose to Brain Delivery for Prevention and Treatment of Alzheimer's Disease. Vem do doutoramento em Ciências Farmacêuticas da Faculdade de Farmácia da Universidade de Coimbra. Do you know someone who suffers from hypertension? Probably yes. And have you ever heard about drugs like Captopril or Losartan? Well, maybe not, but I will tell you that these are drugs approved for the treatment of hypertension. But what if I tell you that these drugs could be used for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease? A disease that affects 50 million people worldwide and for which no effective cure was found since its discovery a hundred years ago. Imagine the relief of the families of patients with Alzheimer's disease that will be able to have back the person they once knew. And imagine the costs that it would save to the healthcare system. It would be a major progress. But you're probably wondering right now, what does these drugs have to do with Alzheimer's, right? So, these drugs act on a system called the renin-angiotensin system that is able to regulate the blood pressure. 
However, recently it was discovered a specific local renin angiotensin system inside our brains. Moreover, hypertensive patients that take this kind of medication are less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease later in life. But before you go and send a message to your parents saying they won't be having Alzheimer's disease because of the pills they take for hypertension, wait a second. Because there are some drawbacks. These drugs are not able to directly reach the brain because of the barrier that surrounds it. So what are we trying to do in order to overcome this obstacle? We are trying to administer these drugs through a secret passage. And you want to know where this secret passage begins? Right on your noses. Just a poof in your nose and the drug directly reaches the brain. Easy, right? But before we get there, there are a lot of studies that have to be done in order to prove the real efficacy of these drugs in Alzheimer's disease. And that's what I'm trying to do in my PhD project. Right now, I'm testing these drugs in different quantities in brain cells and determining if they are toxic or not to these cells and if they are able to reverse some of the main pathological hallmarks of the disease. After this, I will select the most promising molecules and I will administer them to mice with the pathology. And I will determine if the drug effectively reached the brain and if it was able to reverse the cognitive decline characteristic of these animal models. And only then you can send a message to your parents. So, what do you think? Maybe the solution for Alzheimer's disease is already on the market. So, let's not try to discover new drugs. Let's do great things with the ones we have. Thank you. Obrigada, Filipa. Será que já estão todos a ligar aos pais? De seguida, vamos passar então ao André Santos. O André Santos traz-nos a tese Co-Creative Repurposing by Modeling Rhythmic Compatibility. Vem do doutoramento em Engenharia Informática da Faculdade de Ciências e Tecnologia da Universidade de Coimbra. Have you ever found yourself tapping your feet to the rhythm of your favorite songs? What about drumming along with pens and pencils on your desk or even just with your hands? Well, maybe you don't, but myself as a drummer, I have done this for as long as I can remember. And trust me, I have annoyed many friends and family over the years with this. Um, but that's what I'm aiming, no, sorry. Um, so what if we could take these tapped rhythms and convert them into actual drum sounds? And what if we could take those drum sounds and remix them onto songs we like, creating a whole new version of, of that song? That's what I'm aiming for, to develop a co-creative tool that lets you repurpose these tapped rhythms by modeling rhythmic compatibility. Okay, but you might wonder, why is this important? Maybe you're not a music enthusiast like I am. Well, think about it. Musicians and creators need tools to unleash their full potential and creativity, just like a carpenter needs a hammer, right? Think about the, what the electric guitar did for music. And it's our responsibility as engineers and researchers to, to provide and develop those tools to help push the envelope even further nowadays with artificial intelligence and deep learning. Imagine you're a drummer, you're in a band, and you want to record a demo to show to a record company. The guitarist, he plugs his, adap his guitar with an adapter to the computer, strums along, records his part, and done. But the drums, it's not as simple, because drums is an acoustic instrument. You need all these microphones to record the sound properly. So how much easier would it be if you could just tap along on your desk to record a simple version of the drums that you want on your track? That would be much easier, right? OK, great. But how do I plan to do this? Well, I only started my PhD last October, so I still have many things to figure out. But I managed to break my thesis down into four main parts. The first one is to do automatic percussion transcription. And in this first step, and maybe most crucial step, I need to understand these stepped rhythms. What are they representing? Is it a kick drum? Is it a snare hit? The second part is to build a rhythmic compatibility model. So uh, having this transcription of the tapped rhythms, a musical representation, we need to see how does it fit in with our song? Where does it fit? How compatible it is? Thirdly, I need to do, um, remi to, do, to do the remix, I need to do source separation and timbre transfer also. Taking the original song, we need to first remove the drum track from it and put the tap rhythms instead. 
But we don't want random sounds, we want drum sounds. So we need to transfer the timbres of those drums onto the track. Finally, the fourth and final step is to conduct a user uh, co-creative study to study how musicians and non-musicians will use and interact with this type of technology. So next time you're tapping your feet to, to a song, why not sit at your desk? Maybe just don't do it in front of your friends and family. Thank you. Obrigada, André. Seguimos então agora para a Elisa Braz, a nossa décima apresentadora, que traz a tese Jet Cooled and Matrix Isolated Radicals, Monitoring Interactions and Reactions Through IR Spectroscopy, vem do doutoramento em Química da Faculdade de Ciências e Tecnologia da Universidade de Coimbra. Good afternoon. One of the greatest scientists ever, Nikola Tesla, once said, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Molecules are in constant motion, they, and they vibrate as if the bonds connecting the atoms were like little springs. And chemists, chemists, they take information from such vibrations about the molecular structures when infrared light interacts with molecules through a technique called infrared spectroscopy. But molecules, they can be stable or unstable. For example, free radicals. Free radicals are very, uh, whether in science or in politics, they tend to react very fast. They have very, very short lifetimes under the order of microseconds, and so they are very difficult to catch. And they tend to catch electrons from other species. For example, free radicals can damage our cells and DNA, causing illnesses, and also uh, accelerating the aging process. And they are also responsible for ozone depletion in our ozone layer of the Earth's atmosphere. So there is a continuous interest in free radicals and in the mechanisms of re reactions where radicals play a critical role. And there are still a lot to do regarding this. And so my PhD research focuses exactly on this, on the detection of radicals and also in the uh, mechanisms of reactions through infrared spectroscopy. And for that, I make use of a special techniques that allow the, the freezing of these species in small cages, trapping them like they were little prisoners. And I do this through infrared spectroscopy with the aid, but, but chemists, they don't work only in the lab. They also make use of computers. And I interpret my work with the aid of highly sophisticated quantum chemical calculations, very important for frequencies, structures, and energies determination nowadays. And I hope my research work uh, brings awareness that fundamental science matters. Thank you very much. Obrigada, Elisa. Depois destas três primeiras apresentações, e para relaxarmos um bocadinho, e porque eu acredito que o júri está ali um bocadinho também sobre pressão, não são só uh, os nossos finalistas, e agora aqui a experiência. O que é que eu quero dizer com isto da experiência? Gostava de convidar aqui ao palco uma pessoa que foi a primeira vencedora da primeira edição uh, da nossa competição 3 Minutos Tese, o Mauro Pinto, e gostaria também de convidar a nossa segunda, mas como não podia vir, teve o cuidado de nos mandar um pequenino vídeo para, uh, para poder passar uh, a mensagem daquilo que gostaria de deixar para cada um de vós. Assim sendo, gostaria de convidar o Mauro para vir uh, aqui ao palco, falar-nos um bocadinho da sua experiência, uma vez que foi o primeiro vencedor da primeira edição uh, de 3 minutos de tese na Universidade de Coimbra, para nos vir falar um bocadinho o que é que foi isto, como é que foi esta experiência de fazer parte do primeiro grupo, este desafio, Mauro. Chega aqui ao pé de nós. Olá, 
Ana. Olá a todos, antes de mais muito obrigado pelo convite. Eu gostava de ter visto o vídeo primeiro da Brígida, porque assim já sabia o que dizer. Mas pronto, tudo bem. Eu mal cheguei aqui e eu vi logo aqui os concorrentes à minha frente e esta azáfama de ter que ir até ao canto para o microfone. Eu fiquei logo um pouco nervoso, portanto sei bem o que é essa agitação e antes de mais dar-vos os parabéns e não só por terem chegado até aqui, mas por terem tido a coragem e terem perdido um pouco do vosso tempo para estar aqui, porque de facto não é fácil expormos e, e o que nos pedem geralmente é para, para publicarmos artigos e não sei o quê, e isto também é muito importante, e dar este passo para palavras, tão correntes, para palavras mais correntes do dia-a-dia -dia pode ser muito difícil e, e por isso, pá, pessoal, os meus parabéns e espero que tudo vos corra da melhor maneira e se eu puder, eu queria, eu queria vos dar um, uma salva de palmas, se puder ser... De resto, como é que foi a minha experiência? Pronto, foi, o, foi por acaso a primeira edição. Eu sempre gostei muito de comunicar, eu acho que é importante que a ciência saia também dos gabinetes e que vá para as empresas, que vá para as pessoas, para elas sentirem também o que é que nós fazemos no nosso gabinete e porque é que isso é importante, talvez não amanhã, mas daqui a 5, 10, 20 anos, e é muito importante que elas percebam isto e, e aliás... Uh, o 3 MT, essa primeira edição, foi duas semanas antes de ter sido o Covid, salvo erro, e eu acho que agora cada vez mais nós percebemos a importância de ter uma cultura científica na sociedade, e isso foi muito interessante. E a nível pessoal, uh, eu ganhei uma paixão pela comunicação de ciência, uh, por exemplo, estou agora a acabar o meu doutoramento, estou a tentar continuar na carreira académica, mas com uma grande vertente de comunicação de ciência, já consegui fazer uma coisa ou outra, e o que eu vos posso dizer é que, esta experiência impulsionou-me muito e também do ponto de vista do participante, o workshop que o IIC, é, são, são três Is, o Instituto de Investigação Interdisciplinar da Universidade de Coimbra nos deu, uh, acho que foi um workshop muito bom até porque pude conhecer 20 pessoas que estão no mesmo bar que eu em áreas tão diferentes, conheci ali uh, outros problemas, outras situações que não dá para conhecer no nosso dia-a-dia, -dia. eu estou fechado num, num gabinete no departamento de engenharia informática, portanto é difícil sair para o dia-a-dia, -dia. e só aí foi tão bom poder ver outras, outras áreas e outras pessoas. Não sei se há algo mais, ou... pronto, é isto. Obrigada. Portanto... Obrigada, Mauro. Era isso mesmo, era trazer o teu testemunho e, caso vocês não tenham percebido, uma vez no 3 Minutos de Tese, para sempre no 3 Minutos de Tese, porque daqui outras oportunidades se abrem, outras iniciativas e vocês farão sempre parte da nossa main list, não se esqueçam. Deixo-vos agora também um pequenino testemunho que a Brígida gravou para deixar e para que vos deixar uma pequenina mensagem. E assim, o Mauro, a Brígida, hoje eh, sairemos daqui com mais um representante da Universidade de Coimbra desta terceira edição e certamente outros virão nos próximos anos. Mas sim, aqui o que queremos é fazer crescer a comunicação de ciência e mostrar para todos a qualidade e a boa ciência que fazemos na Universidade de Coimbra. Assim sendo, e depois deste pequeno relaxo, vamos retomar então as nossas apresentações. A próxima apresentação será feita pela Ana Carolina Góis, com a tese Development and Efficacy Study of a Step Care Version of a Unified Protocol for Children, an Intervention Program for Parents and Children with Emotional Disorders. Vem do doutoramento em Psicologia Clínica da Faculdade de Psicologia e Ciências de Educação da Universidade de Coimbra.
how many of you know a child with anxious or depressive symptoms? 10 in 100 children present at least one emotional disorder. And in Portugal, only a few will receive the treatment they need. In most cases, the treatment that these children receive will not be adapted to the individual characteristics of each one. Probably, the treatment that these children receive will be too long or too short for their needs or designed for a single emotional disorder. So, what will be the best intervention? Several interventions have been shown to be effective, but recently one has shown particular efficacy and some advantages. The stepped care version of the unified protocol for transdiagnostic treatment of emotional disorders in children. But why this intervention? It's a transdiagnostic treatment which allows intervention in a wide range of emotional disorders all at once. It's an empirical supported intervention. It's a group intervention which allows children to share their difficulties and feel supported. It's an intervention that involves a parental component which allows parents to learn some strategies to deal with emotion regulation difficulties of their children. And it's also an intervention with a reduced therapeutic cost. But how does it work? Generally, in three steps. The first step focuses on diagnostic evaluation. The second step focuses on the underlying mechanisms of emotional disorders. And the third step focus on the exposure techniques with proven effectiveness on the treatment of emotional disorders in children. But all children need to fulfill these three steps? No. Only those who haven't achieved a significant improvement on the second step. We are now studying the stepped care version of Unified Protocol through a pilot study and a randomized control trial comparing this new version with the original version of Unified Protocol. Adding to the advantages of the original version of Unified Protocol, the stepped care version intends to be a form of intervention with a reduced therapeutic cost for therapists, families and children by customizing its duration according to the individual needs of each child. We are sure that this new form of intervention will be an investment in the future of our children. Thank you. Obrigada, Ana. Depois da Ana, temos então a Eliette Gonçalves. Eliette Gonçalves traz-nos até as Curriculum Policies in Rio de Janeiro, Regulations and Effects on Music Education, vem do doutoramento em Ciências da Educação da Faculdade de Psicologia e Ciências da Educação da Universidade de Coimbra. When I was a child, my mother used to tell me a story. There were two young fish swimming. At one point, they meet another fish who speaks. Hello boys, how is the water? They swim a little further and answer, water, what is it? I, will, I let you think about this history for a moment. I have been a music teacher in the public schools of Rio de Janeiro for 15 years, and many times I felt developed as a teacher inside and outside the classroom as my subject was seen a minor in front of others considered more important. However, during the pandemic, when we were in confinement, we opened our windows to listen and make music. Music has this humanizing capacity. Art is something so essential that sometimes we can't see its importance, like the little fish that couldn't see the water. In Brazilian schools, music has lived an inconstance, sometimes present due to legislation, sometimes absent. And this has consequences in school and in society. And this is the starting point of my thesis, to understand how this thought about the place music occupies today in Brazilian schools and in Rio de Janeiro are formed. For this, I needed to go back in other historical times when music was considered necessary or dispensable, to analyze these events, the scores that became true or truths, this allowing the construction of a social thought. 
All these times are crossed by language parameters. So which is this language? The said, the written, and the live that I use to understand the social thought about music education. So I analyze documents, the curriculum, and the ways of teaching music inside and outside the classroom. For me, as a music teacher, this thesis contributes to understand these broader social truths that take place in school and out of school as we constitute and become subject, society, and as we become human. Thank you. Muito bem, Eliette. Seguimos então agora para o nosso 13 terceiro apresentador, Gaston Deschamps, que nos traz a, a, a tese Inclusion in Judo, Perceptions of Coaches Toward Inclusion and Intervention Strategies for Judokas with Development Disorders. Vem da, tem um doutor, traz, vem do doutoramento em Ciências do Desporto da Faculdade de Ciências do Desporto e Educação Física da Universidade de Coimbra. How can judo make the world a better place? As a judo teacher, fascinated by the sport and by human diversity, I am deeply convinced that this activity, which has benefits at all levels, bio, psycho and social, is a key to the essential challenge of inclusion in our society. Judo, for people with special needs, is more and more developed on the field, but not enough yet at an academic level, which could help all judo teachers to form themselves better on their strategy of inclusion. From this constraint, I decided to develop an academic and field project about the inclusion of persons with developmental disorder, more in particular autism, cerebral palsy, and intellectual disability, in judo. This project is very focused on the teacher itself. Firstly, to enrich our work from various professional experience, and secondly, to use the synthesized knowledge to help everyone to face challenge regarding inclusion. Why judo? Judo is a method of education based on two principles. First, the best use of the energy through the concept of adaptation. Secondly, the one of mutual prosperity at the society level. Adaptation is to my own abilities, adaptation to one else's ability, and from it, growing together in a context of mutual prosperity. What are we studying? We will create a questionnaire based on interviews which we already conduct with various judo teachers in Europe that will be shared to as many judo teachers as possible around the world. For the very first time, at an academic level, a research tool from this form will be created and validated in order to understand the global perceptions of inclusion. How this research will be useful on the field? From our and everyone else's knowledge in the field, we will synthesize and create a manual which explains the best strategies, didactical and pedagogical tools which help the best to catalyze and facilitate this concept of inclusion. Judo, through its intrinsic philosophy, allows people with diverse ability to come and grow up together as an individual in the society through the work realized on the mat. Judo, with competent teachers with the right inclusive skill and used as a method of education, help everyone to come and to grow up together, as well as creating a more inclusive world and therefore a better society. Thank you. Obrigada, Gaston. Seguimos então para a Vânia Almeida. A Vânia traz-nos a tese Pulmonary Carcinoma, Tumoral Microenvironment and Digital Pathology with Computational Image Analysis. Vem do doutoramento em Ciências da Saúde da Faculdade de Medicina da Universidade de Coimbra. Música 
Hello everybody. So for my PhD, I will study the lung cancer. And in the lung cancer, we have cells that undergo malignant transformation. I mean, they uh, grow in an unorganized cells um, way, and those are the malignant cells. But the tumor is not only the, the malignant cells. There are, uh, there are also the structural component that holds the malignant cells together. And this is called the stroma. So we know now that the stroma is extremely important for the tumoral growth and also for uh, impacts, also impacts on the, um, the prognosis. And in some cases, we can also uh, help helps us to select the, the, the treatment for uh, some patients. Um, so. As a pathologist, I can usually, well, almost always, I can see the malignant cells on the slide. But identifying the stroma, it's a much harder task because I can vaguely see that some tumors have a more inflammatory uh, stroma component than the others, but it's not very easy to quantify it. So, uh, fortunately, pathology is changing, and it's changing a lot, because instead of looking at the slides through the microscope, now I can see, and even most of the times with a better quality, the, the image on my computer. And that allows me to do a lot of different things. Uh, in, in, in particular, the use of artificial intelligence on the slide. And that allows me to do amazing stuff, like I can, uh, I can see exactly what, where is the stroma, what kind of cells are within the stroma, and even quantify it. And it's, it opens a lot of possibilities. So, what, that is precisely what we are going to do in our project. We will um, really uh, understand the stroma of real cases, uh, diagnosed over there at our hospital, and we will try to understand, quantify, and qualify the stroma component of a lot of tumors. And with that, with that, with that extracted information, we can collect it with the usual things that we use, like pathology, the normal pathology stuff, and also with, with the clinical and follow-up stuff, and we will understand, and we hopefully will understand that there are some, some characters that impact on prognosis. And this is our main um, work. Thank you. Obrigada, Vânia. Seguimos agora para a Catarina Paiva. A Catarina traz-nos a tese Natural, Social and Cultural History of Cannabis in Portugal. Vem do doutoramento em Ciências Farmacêuticas da Faculdade de Farmácia da Universidade de Coimbra. What is the most promising plant in the world? It is the most useful plant in the world with over than 25,000 uses. It is the most chemically studied. It is a plant recognized by law as both environmentally and economically sustainable. We are talking about the most controversial plant in the world, cannabis. After the discovery of endocannabinoid system for about 30 years ago, Physicians and scientists realized they could not ignore the therapeutic potential of this plant. Loved by some, hated by others, cannabis has undergone profound legislative changes that have led to enormous growth in its legal market. The story of this plant is unique. What about in Portugal? Is there any history of cannabis in Portugal? Yes, there is, and it's amazing. Cannabis was once one of the most important crops in our nation, in the greatest history of our country, the discoveries. Without this plant, this epic age would not have been possible. The studies about history of cannabis in Portugal are sparse, namely about medicinal cannabis. Our study aims to do research not only about the natural, but also the social and cultural history of cannabis in Portugal to evaluate the reception of this plant throughout history and to analyze existent law and historical trail. Today, in Portugal, this topic is extremely relevant, as it is in the rest of the world. Since April 2021, it is possible, it has been possible to purchase cannabis flower in our pharmacies. And in 2020, we had the largest cannabis medicinal plantation in Europe. This project will allow to identify the needs and gaps of health professionals to reduce the stigma that the long years of prohibition have brought us and to promoting healthy lives and ensuring well-being for all and at all 
that all ages a development and sustainable development goal of United Nations. By tracing an historical trail, we intend to help to define an assertive path to, to find, to contribute to legislative clarity and to allow a good use of this plant. Cannabis is the most promising plant in the world. This extraordinary plant can be the sustainable response to both economic and environmental problems while the greatest therapeutic option of the future. Obrigada, Catarina. Seguimos então com a Inês Simões. Traz-nos a tese Portuguese Validation and Normative Studies of the Childhood Executive Functioning Inventory. Vem do doutoramento em Psicologia da Faculdade de Psicologia e Ciências de Educação da Universidade de Coimbra. Here knows a child who only says their heads up in the clouds. Everyone, right? What if I told you that that child has problems in their executive functions? You're probably asking yourselves, what the hell are executive functions? Executive functions are cognitive processes that allow a person to self-regulate. But what do they actually do? They allow a person to plan, to find priorities, and maintain the effort to achieve their goals. So, they're kind of like the CEOs of the brain. They maintain and prioritize information, and without them, chaos ensues. But, are they really important? Should we care about them? Well, we need to have good executive functions to do pretty much anything in our daily lives. On the grander scheme of things, they play a crucial role in the development of social, emotional, and learning skills. That's why it's important to have a tool that can evaluate them. And that's where my PhD project comes in. My project aims to collect the data of the Portuguese population regarding the SHEGI. SHEGI evaluates uh, executive functions in children ages 4 to 12 and can be answered by parents and teachers, providing psychologists with critical information. But why did we focus on this age group? Well, Although executive functions develop throughout life, it's in childhood that many crucial developments take place. If we think about uh, disorders like ADHD and autism, which are typically diagnosed in this age range, they display executive dysfunction. The sooner we can identify executive dysfunction, the sooner we can intervene in it. But why did we choose Shaji and not some other option? Contrary to other options, SHEGI is a very brief and easy to understand instrument. And it's also the first of its kind to be made available for free, so that even psychologists who work in low budget settings like schools can have access to a quality tool. So, what's the contribution of my project? An easy, fast and free screening tool that can be used in scientific research and psychological intervention in Portugal. That way, that sound we all thought of in the beginning can get the help that they need wherever they are. Thank you. Obrigado, Inês. Depois da de Inês temos a Tânia Silva. A Tânia traz-nos a tese Coronopharmacokinetics and Coronopharmacodynamics and Antidepressant Drugs. Vem do, vem do doutoramento em Ciências Farmacêuticas da Faculdade de Farmácia da Universidade de Coimbra. How can we have a better treatment for depression? 
This is an important question because depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide and the number of depressed patients has been increasing exponentially, especially since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. However, antidepressants are only effective about 50 to 65% of the cases and about 80% of depressed patients stop their treatment within a month because treatments usually take three to four weeks to be effective. Also, antidepressants have very distinct side effects that vary from patient to patient and then sometimes are the reason for a patient not even adhere to treatment. So how can we improve the treatment with antidepressants? Well, I can give you two options. The first option is to find a better way. Antidepressants are oral drugs, so they are spread throughout your body and only a small fraction reaches the target organ, which is the brain. But what if there is a faster way to reach the brain? Because there is a direct pathway between the nose to your brain, intranasal administration could be beneficial for antidepressants. We could use lower drug concentrations to achieve the same effects, and we could have a reduction of side effects. The second option is to find a better time for the administration, because time dictates how your body reacts to a drug. Do you know why? You remember the jet lag that you felt when traveling through multiple time zones? This is actually related to your circadian rhythm. It's your internal body clock. This clock tells you when to wake up, when to sleep, when to eat. Basically helps you to keep your daily routine. It also regulates all your organs to function at the right time. This is why you could have a different response to a drug if it taken at different times of the day. Finding the right time for a medication has already been demonstrated for other drugs for other diseases like cancer, arthritis and hypertension. And depression should not be an exception. So we believe that at a specific time of the day, an antidepressant can be more effective or can have lower side effects according to the individual circadian rhythm. Overall, if we have a better route and a better time for the administration of antidepressants, we may have a happier answer for depression. Thank you. Obrigada, Tânia. Agora seguimos, tivemos aqui uma pequenina uh, alteração, passámos do 17 para o 19, é, houve aqui uma, uma desistência de uma, de uma das nossas participantes, só para ali para o júri não se desorientar na sua tabela. Assim sendo, seguimos para a Inês Caramelo, que veio direto a Braga, um desafio. Inês, a Inês traz-nos a, a tese New Approaches in Hypoxic, Ischemic Encephalopathy, Translational Research to Diagnose and Monitory Response to Stem Cell, cell, stem cell Therapy. Vem do doutoramento em Biologia Experimental e Biomedicina do Instituto de Investigação interdisciplinar da Universidade de Coimbra. So, have you heard, ever heard about perinatal asphyxia? Well, probably not, because it's a rare disease, but it happens and has devastating effects on a children's life. It is caused by an interruption of the blood flow through the umbilical cord to the newborn, and it takes only 30 seconds to permanently damage the brain, and it causes cerebral palsy, epilepsy, motor and cognitive dysfunction, a panoply of diseases that we cannot even want to imagine. And the problem to this disease is that either there is no diagnosis or therapeutic approach for this disease. So this is where my PhD comes in. My PhD aims to develop a strategy with stem cells to treat the disease. But what do you think about when you think about stem cells? We take the stem cell cells from the umbilical cord and we put the cells on a plastic box, right? But think with me, the texture of the umbilical cord is soft and the texture of the a plastic box is rigid, rigid. So when we are putting the cells inside a plastic box, we are stressing the cells. Also, if you think, cells in a lab, they breathe the same levels of oxygen as we are breathing right now in here. But if you think the levels of oxygen inside our body, they are lower. So when we are having the cells in the lab, we are stressing the cells by overexposing them to higher levels of oxygen. 
My PhD strategy is to develop a, develop a platform where cells will have the, so, the softness similar to the umbilical cord and the, uh, the oxygen levels will be controlled to be similar to the umbilical to the, to the inside our body. This way, we'll have cells more relaxed. And why? Because we all know that the best outcomes that we can take from the stem cells come, come from when the cells are not stressed at all, right? But how are we going to develop this therapeutic approach? We are going to put the neurons in contact with the stem cells. And how they communicate? They communicate through molecules. And this is where we'll come in, because they'll speak through molecules, and we are going to be the spies, because we are going to intersect the messages that they are exchanging between the neurons and the stem cells, and we are going to decodify. And to decodify these messages, we'll be able to develop a therapeutic approach. With this project, I truly believe that we can give a chance to, this, to the children that have suffered from an episode of, uh, of perinatal asphyxia and improve the quality of life of these newborns. Thank you. Obrigada, Inês. Seguimos então agora para a Juliana Sediak, que nos traz a tese Eco Innovation Partnerships, vem do doutoramento em Direito Público da Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Coimbra. Did you know that in the year 2020 alone, the United States spent $665 billion on public contracting, the so-called public procurement, and year by year, the European Union has been spending 14% of its GDP on public procurement. We are talking about three trillion euros. Now, what if a big part of these resources were spent on eco-innovation goods, such as public transportation seats made from industrial waste, or noise barriers for highways made from scrap tires, or public lighting made from recycled plastic bottles. All these materials are new uses for discarded materials, reuse of waste. In circular, econ innovation, in circular economy, innovation can be used so that we can uh, reduce our production model on environment. All these examples are examples that can be supplied by public administration to the citizens. We are talking about a contract called by European procurement rules, eco-innovation partnerships, and they have at one side a public player such as the federal government, an agency, or city council, and on the other side a private player such as an individual or a company who has the technology or the concept to bring government's intent to life. Green public procurement, green public contracts are now considered to be one of the key tools for sustainable and inclusive economic development. They can create a huge market for um, innovations, but its potential remains underused. Now, does our legal system allow the government to spend on eco-innovation? And if so, what adaptations, flexibilities can be made so that these partnerships can be validly carried out. Are our traditional procurement principles such as um, free competition, equality, are they compatible with these partnerships? These are some of the questions that I will address on my dissertation. And I hope I can help bring eco-innovation towards green products and services to the public administration. Thank you. Esta expressão da Juliana resume todo o sentimento que os nossos candidatos sentiram ao longo destas semanas de preparação. 
Foi muita dedicação, muitas viagens, estamos a falar de muitos deles que nem sequer estão a viver em Portugal, alguns que vieram de fora, outros que estão de norte a sul do país e que tiveram sempre a dedicação de vir, de participar, de estar nas formações e de nunca faltarem em nenhuma das atividades, porque de facto aqui falamos de crescimento, falamos de aprendizagem e falamos de um espírito que foi criado entre todos eles e por isso é que esta formação em conjunto e presencialmente acredito que foi tão valiosa e que temos aqui não 20 finalistas, mas um grupo de finalistas cada vez mais despertos e com vontade de trabalhar e de promover a sua ciência através da comunicação de ciência. Por isso, uma salva de palmas para todos eles. Já apresentaram os 20. O que quer dizer que agora o que vamos fazer é uma pequenina pausa, vamos dar aqui a oportunidade para ver se tudo está bem com as, com as votações, chegar aqui à conclusão de quem é o vencedor e enquanto isso convido-vos se quiserem a ver o nosso site, mas acredito que neste momento vão querer ir até lá fora, beber qualquer coisa, comer qualquer coisa e descansarem um bocadinho. Daqui a nada, uns 20, 20 minutos, já vos chamamos para vocês voltarem todos e para receberem os certificados, vamos dar os certificados aos nossos, aos nossos finalistas e saber então quem vai ser a ou o representante da Universidade de Coimbra na nossa competição do Coimbra Group. Até já!
boa tarde novamente, espero que tenham relaxado um bocadinho, descansado, reposto de energias. Estamos então agora de volta para a parte, se eu ligar o nosso ponteiro, vamos agora então seguir para a parte dos certificados. Como ainda estamos numa fase que não é muito fácil dar abraços e beijinhos, vamos facilitar um bocadinho. E o que vamos fazer é, vamos chamando, está bem? Vocês recebem uh, o certificado e depois vão ficando aqui para podermos tirar uma foto de família. Está bem? Para isso vou voltar a convidar ao palco a nossa vice-reitora para a investigação e terceiro ciclo para me ajudar a dar, a dar os certificados aos nossos uh, finalistas. Então, chamo o Finifolo, chamo a Vera, o Kevin, peraí Kevin, o Kevin, O Jonatas. A Helena. O Vitor. Tiago, agora a Filipa, pode já encaminhar-se, o André, a Filipa aqui a subir, o André pode subir também, a seguir a Elisa, pode-se preparar, vou ter que apertar um bocadinho aqui no palco. Temos a Elisa, de seguida temos a Ana Carolina. Ana, força. Tá? A Eliette pode-se preparar também. A Eliette. A Eliette que fez um grandíssimo esforço para fazer o discurso em inglês. Eu acho que foi de facto, e os colegas que, que estão aqui sabem-me dizer isso. Agora temos o Gaston. A Vânia. A Catarina. A Inês, a Tânia, a Inês. E a Juliana. <risos> Muito bem conquistada. E essa, vamos tirar então uma foto aqui de família. Se calhar temos que nos juntar um bocadinho mais, não é? Vamos aqui fazer uma segunda. Convidar quem pode aqui para. Sim, pode
depois da nossa fotografia de família, seguimos então agora para saber quem foram os três melhores classificados desta tarde. Vamos começar então com o terceiro lugar. E assim sendo, o terceiro lugar vai para... Força! Filipa Gouveia. Em segundo lugar temos Tânia Silva. E agora, em primeiro lugar, e agora sim quero rufos, <risos> temos... Então, em primeiro lugar, nesta terceira edição, 3 minutos de tese doutoramento da Universidade de Coimbra, temos, o júri decidiu, e decidiu muito bem, uh, Kevin Leandro. já então o nosso representante que nos que vai servir como o nosso grande representante para que a Universidade de Coimbra entre nesta competição internacional a fase seguinte vai ser uh, todo um novo júri com representações das 42 universidades vão eleger os três melhores e como vos disse espero seriamente que o Kevin seja um desses três escolhidos para que o tenhamos e tenhamos a Universidade de Coimbra representada na Universidade de Padova nesta grande final do 3 minutos teste a nível europeu. Resta-me agora agradecer a presença dos nossos fantásticos finalistas, a colaboração e a participação de todos os 38 que se candidataram a esta competição, agradecer ao nosso magnífico júri que despendeu do seu tempo, da sua dedicação também para avaliar os nossos candidatos, a todos aqueles que tiveram e tiraram um bocadinho do seu tempo para ver esta competição, acreditar que é assim que fazemos crescer a comunicação de ciência e é assim que fazemos chegar mais ciência a todos e a todas e agradecer também à, à nossa Câmara Municipal de Coimbra que teve o gosto de nos participar e de nos disponibilizar aqui esse nosso fantástica sala para que pudéssemos ter esta grande final que juntou 20 finalistas e juntou muita vontade de fazer crescer a comunicação de ciência na Universidade de Coimbra. Obrigada e até para o ano.